Hey everyone, I'm back with another passage breakdown. This one's gonna be the AMC FLE5 Psych Soch Passage 7. And they do a pretty good little like AMC, AMC trick that I wanna point out to y'all in this passage because it's gonna pertain to like a lot of different sections of the practice exams and stuff and your real MCAT. But if you're new here, I should introduce myself. My name's Maggie, I'm a third year medical student currently in my pediatrics rotation. I'm on my last two weeks of third year in the inpatient nephrology unit. I run this channel on this business with my brother, John, who's a fourth year student who just matched plastic surgery. We were both professional MCAT tutors before we went to med school and we still do it all here on this channel. If you like these breakdowns, make sure to like and subscribe and all that stuff, but also check out our AMC or our strategies course on our website. That'll be linked down in the description below because you can get what I'm doing right now for every single passage that the AMC makes on AMC's exams one through four. All right, that's my plug. So like I said, this is a psych -so section passage. So it's pretty short and you can see down here, we don't have like a title or anything like that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Biases can influence how we process new information and update our beliefs. In study one, researchers examined the conditions under which individuals are willing to update their beliefs about the frequency of various negative life events such as Alzheimer's disease or robbery. Very different ends of the spectrum on the negative life events. But this is classic psych -soch, right? Like they're gonna give us a study or two and then they're gonna ask us questions to basically draw conclusions from the study. But usually they will pretty well say the results and that's what I've highlighted down there. We'll get to it. In the first phase of the experiment, the participants were asked about their pre preconceived notions of the frequency of negative events okay so we have an idea of how often negative events happen when we're coming into the study they didn't pick specific people they just picked random people or we weren't told that they pick specific people the researchers found a tendency to underestimate the frequency of negative events okay the participants also believe that they were at a lower risk of experiencing negative events compared to other individuals so sort of that invincibility fallacy if you will that like teenagers have you know like we kind of carry that throughout adult is what it sounds like. In the second phase of the experiment, the participants were given new information about the frequency of various negative events. Sometimes the information was better than what the participant expected. For example, they were told that negative events occur less frequently than they had thought, and then other times the new information was worse than expected. The results, here we go, the results showed that people were more likely to update their beliefs when the new information suggested that negative events were less likely than they expected. So to bring it all together, not only do these participants believe that negative life events happen less frequently than they actually do, they also are more likely to believe when they're given new information that they happen even less frequently. So if the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is one in a thousand, I'm pulling these numbers out of my butt. If the prevalence is actually one in a thousand, then these participants would say, I think probably Alzheimer's is like one in 5,000. And then if they are given new information that says, no, it's actually one in 10,000, they're more likely to believe that than if they were told, no, it's one in 1,000. So sort of interesting there. And then in study two, another group of participants watched a short clip depicting a car accident. So that would be like a negative life event. A week later, the participants were presented with a written summary of the clip they viewed previously. For group A, the written summary contained small errors that made the car accident in the video appear more serious than it really was. So we're, it's more negative, if that makes sense, or it's, a worse outcome, it is more serious. And then for group B, the written summary contained small errors that made the car accident appear less serious than it really was. For the control group, the written summary contained no errors. After a delay of one more week, the participants were asked to retrieve their memory of the original video as accurately as they could. The researchers were interested in the, particip the participants' likelihood of creating false memories for the car accident. So you can see that we were given study one and they told us the results of study one and I highlighted them. They told us what they did for study two and they did not tell us the results. So what we're supposed to do in this situation, this is a classic like double AMC psych so special, is we're supposed to apply the results from study one to study two. Luckily, these like studies are very similar to one another. That's not always the case. Sometimes you kind of have to like really think out of the box about like how they relate to one another and how you can apply the results to one another. But in this case, we can talk about how, what it would look like to apply these results because um, several of the questions ask you to do that. But that's like a key skill, I think, for the psych -so section. So not only being able to pick out what the results are, but also being able to apply them to a new study. The participants in study one ignore information that suggests that negative events 
are more likely than they think. This is best characterized as an example of, and then they do another like classic double AMC thing where really they're giving you all these different like options in the context of the passage. But what they really want you to know is, do you know what conformity is? Do you know what cognitive dissonance is? Do you know what group polarization is? And do you know what this heuristic is? So let's go ahead and define those. So conforming, I think that kind of speaks for itself, but that's going to be like when we kind of comply to a set of rules or expectations in order to sort of like fit in with our peers or the group that we're trying to fit in with. Cognitive dissonance is going to be like when you think one way and act another or when you think one way and are presented information that is to the contrary or you have like two thoughts in your head that you cannot simultaneously believe both of them and so they cause cognitive dissonance which is sort of like this uncomfortable feeling where you kind of have to like pick and choose what you believe or change your beliefs based on the facts that are presented to you. Group polarization is going to be like when you get in a large group you're more likely to have highly polarized thoughts or beliefs than you otherwise would if you were just by yourself. So maybe a group of 10 people who would self-identify as Republican or Democrat, whatever it is, when they get in a group of 10 people, their beliefs are more like right wing or left wing than they otherwise would be on their own. Like maybe they would just be like your standard Republican or your standard Democrat. But when they get in a group, when you start chatting with those people in the group, you come out, everyone comes out more polarized than that otherwise would be. I think I just responded to a YouTube comment saying that we're not gonna get political, so I think it's funny that. That's just the easiest way to think about it, honestly. And then the representativeness heuristic. I was horrible at these heuristics, but I just looked it up to remind myself. This is actually one of the ones that makes a little bit of sense, like the way that it is, like the, the word representative, because the representativeness heuristic is like, say we see a man in you know, I don't know why I gave him a top hat. Okay. Say we see a man in like a nice suit, right? He's got a button down, whatever. He's got nice shoes on, anything, whatever. And you were to ask, is this man a farmer or a CEO? Like based on, <laughs> I have to get rid of this top hat. I don't think CEOs wear top hats like that. Let's give him a cool hairstyle. Most people would probably pick that this man is a CEO based on what he looks like because he represents, he's a representative of CEOs because CEOs are the ones that wear the nice business suits. But it's actually based just on statistics alone. He's much more likely to be a farmer because there's more farmers in the world than there are CEOs, regardless of what he's wearing. So the representativeness heuristic is that. Our mind immediately jumps to, oh, he's a representative picture of this group, therefore I'm going to assume he's part of that group. And I'm not going to think about, like there, there are specific like fallacies and stuff that this can lead to, but I think that it's, it's best to just think about it like this. Like you're not going to be thinking about what's actually most statistically likely, you're going to be thinking about what you see in front of your eyes and you're seeing that this man is wearing a suit and so you're going to assume he's a CEO. Okay, that's all of those terms. But to actually answer this question, someone thinking that or someone choosing not to believe that negative events are more likely than they think, is that an example of conformity? It would be an example of conformity if it was like everyone around them like doesn't believe that these negative life events happen very often and so they don't believe it either. That's like more conformity. That's not really what's happening here. B, they're discounting information that causes cognitive dissonance. So the by definition, a negative life event is something that we don't want to believe is like gonna happen to us, like it is a negative thing. And so if we are to think that these are more likely, that could create some cognitive dissonance because it is not in alignment with what they currently think. That's the important part of cognitive dissonance and how it relates to the study. People are thinking one way and then they're being told information that is opposite of, or that's not in line with what they think. And not only that, it's something that they don't want to readily believe. That is sort of key for cognitive dissonance. They don't want to believe that negative events are more likely than, than they previously had thought. So it would make sense that that would cause some cognitive dissonance. So I'll say maybe on that one. C, experiencing group polarization regarding negative information. This, in this case, again, we, ha we were given no indication that these people were in groups or that any kind of those group dynamic type thought processes can go on. So sim for similar reasons as A, I don't like that. I don't like C. And then D, 
representativeness heuristic again we were not told anything sort of similar to what I was talking about earlier I'm trying to like do mental gymnastics to find a way to make this study sort of fit with a representativeness heuristic, but I can't really think of anything right now. I think the important thing is that you guys can define all these terms because that is very key for psych social. Every time you go through a question like this, when you're reviewing it, you need to ask yourself like, do you know all of these terms? Because if you don't, you need to make Anki card on it or watch a video on it or commit it to memory somehow. The next question says, based on the findings from study one, which outcome is most likely for study two? So this is what I was talking about with where they give you the results of a study and then make you apply it to another. So I want you guys to hear group A, group A, we are increasing the negativity, I guess. And then group B, we were telling them that the car wreck really wasn't as bad as, as what it was. So then what, what were the results from study one? People were more likely to update their beliefs when the new information suggested that negativity was decreased or negative events were less likely than expected. So in group B, we're going to update our beliefs. And in group A, we're not. We're going to maintain what we thought we saw in the first place in the video of the car wreck. So a source monitoring error is what we're really looking for. And a source monitoring error is basically like you being wrong or like recalling the wrong thing. And so if you are updating your beliefs and you're saying, I saw this with my own two eyes, but then I was given information later that was different than it. And you go back and like subsequently basically change that that memory, that recollection of that memory. That's a source monitoring error. So group B is the one that is updating their beliefs. They are making the source monitoring errors because they are changing what they know to be true or like what their memory was beforehand. Okay. Based on the findings from study one, which graph shows the most likely outcome for study two. And then you can read all of these are going to have the same axes. So the y-axis is average likelihood of constructing false memories. So again, that's going to be sort of like source monitoring errors. So luckily, if you got this question right, then you'll probably get this question right. So we know that group B is going to be updating their beliefs. They're making the source monitoring errors. So they are going to be constructing false memories. So anything that has group B having less false memories than anything else is automatically wrong. And then group, I mean, then answer choice B, also they're not gonna have the same as group A because group A was not likely to update their beliefs, right? They, they did not construct false memories. They kept their memories of the original car accident. So A is correct. Now, even if, like if control had been up here and group A had been down here, if, if they had had an answer choice that looked like that, you would still be able to mark it off because if you were like, there are some people that are going to update their beliefs, right? This isn't a black and white type situation. They were just saying people in group B were more likely to construct these false memories. Group A still probably constructed some false memories. And then the control only had the true memory, the true car accident that was reinforced so they're obviously going to have the few, the fewest kind of false memory constructions. So anyway, regardless, that's kind of an aside, but I just want you guys to, to be confident in, in picking, even if there was like an answer choice that looked like this, you would still know it was wrong if this one existed. Okay. And then the last question, the studies who conducted or the researchers who conducted study one were interested in the individual differences between the participants in terms of how they update their beliefs. The participants scores on which variable would be most likely to predict how they update their beliefs. So now we're looking at the individual level, level right? And you can kind of look down here and see that these are all things that vary between different people. So based on the results of the study, we know that people are more likely to update their beliefs if they're given information that things were actually better better than they seemed in the first place. What does that remind you of out of these answer choices? It reminds me of an optimistic person who's always looking on the bright side, always thinking that things are better than they actually are. So I was drawn to optimism immediately, but I wanted to also like rule out the other ones. So self-esteem, of course, self-esteem is going to be in general, sort of how you feel about yourself, confidence, those types of things. And similarly, self-efficacy is kind of like how, how, much you believe in yourself to do certain things or to like get things done or to have the ability to get things done, I guess. Neither one of those stuck out to me the way optimism did because they don't have anything to do with like negativity 
or the way that we view the world. They are all about how we view ourselves. Whereas optimism, you can think of it as sort of like a lens in which we view the rest of the world. We view life events through them. And this study was all about the way that we view life events and the way that we are able to sort of like recall past life events. So that doesn't, to me, that doesn't scream anything similar to self-esteem or self-efficacy, which are sort of more how we feel about ourselves. And then impression management is going to be how we sort of, that executive function of us presenting ourselves in certain ways to those around us. So again, that's more about you presenting yourself to the world and not so much how we are recalling things in the world or how we are viewing things in the world. Does that make sense? Like impression management is really more about like other people and how you are trying to come across to them. So none of the, this is another one of those question types, which are just so, I mean, probably at least every other question on psych Soch is basically just making sure that you know these terms. That's why we say like psych is, you know, the whole MCAT is a mile wide and an inch deep, but psych is like, five miles wide and half an inch deep because you just have to know such a small amount about all of these terms, right? Like you basically need to know like the definition of them and how to tell the difference between these terms. Like how do you know the definition of self-esteem and self-efficacy? Yes, but know the differences between those and how to pick that out. And the best way to do that is by coming up with examples. And so I always just would like Google something. If I couldn't come up with something myself, or maybe you can use AI to make like a a thing for you like an example for you but to me especially like I was really bad at the heuristics right so I would have to like I could not remember the t the definition of the heuristics I had to have examples for them so that's my tip to you for psych -soch. have examples and then get good at not only reading research and, and getting your own results for yourself because they're not always going to be listed out like this for you but also being able to apply those results to novel scenarios right that's a whole MCAT rigmarole, applying concepts to new situations. So there's that. All right, guys, that's all I have. Again, if you like this kind of video or you like these kind of breakdowns, we've done hundreds of them, literally 204 to be exact. And you can get all of them on our website below. So check out the links in the description. Let me know what you want to see next. We're kind of leaning into not just MCAT anymore, but MCAT plus like med school, application, adjacent, all that kind of stuff. So again, let us know what you want to see in the comments below and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.